Hi, I'm Joe Chura. Happy New Year and welcome to 630 Neighborville. Today on the show, we'll take a look at MPD's response to the mental health crisis. An expert helps us avoid injury this winter. We're checking out 2023's hottest new books. And we'll find out what's next for a Naperville-ian who just retired after four decades in TV. But first, we're off to meet two new K-9 cops. The Naperville Police Department has two new officers who are sniffing away crime in Naperville. German Shepherd Dax and Labrador Retriever Riggs are the latest to join the NPD's K-9 unit. Officer Matt Susness and his K-9 Riggs are assigned to the Investigations Division's drug unit. Officer Alexis Hammer and her K-9 Dax are assigned to patrol. The two K-9s join the force with some everyday training under their collar. Once with their handler, more advanced scenarios got them ready for the field. Still, new to the job, memorable and important moments have already been made. Honestly, his first day out, we were able to do a um, exterior open air sniff of a vehicle and was able to uh, detect the odor of cocaine inside of the vehicle and we found illegal ammunition as well. Um, just yesterday, he was able to do a currency sniff uh, for a federal agency uh, and detected the odor of narcotics on the currency as well. Uh, so these are some, some good moments for only having him for, you know, a couple months at this point. While on patrol, Officer Hammer and Dax also have had some important encounters. We've done numerous vehicle sniffs so far. Uh, we've, oh, we almost had the opportunity to do an article search. That's basically when a suspect flees an area and maybe they tossed the weapon and whatnot and we haven't found it yet. So he's able to detect human odor on articles. He's able to detect human odor via tracks. Um, as well as narcotic sniffs and that kind of thing. As the canines become more experienced, so will their handlers. It's both Officer Susness and Officer Hammer's first time as canine handlers, but it's always been Susness's goal to get there. It's been my dream, honestly. Uh, some people want to be astronauts and doctors. I wanted to be a canine handler with a police department. Um, one of the police departments that I worked for prior to this uh, was never going to have a canine program, so I had the opportunity to apply here and obviously work with him. Uh, and apply towards this, so it's a it's a dream come true. The Naperville Police Canine Unit now consists of four canines, with Riggs and Dax joining Rocco and Jill, both of whom were appointed to the department in 2017. For Naperville News 17, I'm Joe Kennedy. I'm joined now by Naperville Police Chief Jason Aries. He's here to talk about the tools and training the department relies on to best serve individuals experiencing a mental health crisis. Thank you for being here today, Chief. Thanks for having me, Joe. So I heard one in five Americans suffer from mental health. What is the Naper Naperville Police Department doing to get in front of this and respond to the mental health crisis that we're facing? That's a great question because in addition to that one in five, we go to about a thousand mental health calls per year as a police department. So like anything we do, it starts with training because when you become a police officer, you don't realize, you think I'm going out into the community to solve crime related problems. Mm -hmm. Mental health kind of that unknown. So our job as a staff is to make sure we're properly trained to handle those things. So. All of our officers start out with a basic eight hour mental health awareness class. But what we're doing as a department is we're taking that to the next level. There's a training out there that's called crisis intervention training. It's a 40 hour training, CIT, on how to deal with individuals in mental health crisis. It's very advanced and it's giving you tools and techniques to how to deescalate and connect with those in a mental health crisis. And I'm proud to say almost 75% of our police officers are CIT certified. We will eventually have 100% of our staff certified in that to best handle these calls. What are the benefits that you're seeing from this training? Again, it goes back to de-escalation. Much of what we do in policing is to quickly solve a problem, quickly stop a crime. In mental health related calls, it's often quite the opposite. You want to slow things down. You want to mm. find a common connection with someone that's in a mental health crisis. You want to bring that situation down. So that CIT training, again, it teaches you different ways, what types of different, how to identify different mental health crises folks may be in, because there's a bunch of different um, issues we could be dealing with, mm -hmm. how to connect with them, find that common thread, and peacefully resolve that situation that's at hand. 
Is the department doing anything else when it comes to mental health? Yeah, a lot of folks don't know. We actually have three social workers and a counselor on the police department staff. And what they do is we don't just go to calls and deal with it that day and it's done. Those mental health professionals who work for the police department, they follow up on them, much like a detective would on a criminal case, to go meet with the individual, make sure they have the right resources in place. Do they know where they can go for help? Are they getting the help they need? So they're following up with that person just to make sure they have the right things in place to help themselves. And then hopefully the goal of reducing recidivism of us going to those calls, because quite often, we end up at a lot of the same addresses or dealing with the same individuals. And part of that is they just haven't found the right treatment yet. So our clinicians almost act like a paramedic would. Get hmm. their triage, get them in line with the resources they need to hopefully get them on that path um, to being recovered as best they can. What are some of the things that the officers and the social workers see and they're faced with? Uh, Again, going back to folks in crisis, it could be just something with a person who's agitated for an unknown reason at that time. It could be a lot of domestic disputes have a mental health component to them. Some crimes are mental health related. So there's a, there's a myriad of things. There's not just like, hey, we're going to this type of call that's mental health related. Much of what we deal with, mental health issues are intertwined with those incidents. Hmm. That makes sense. So. What are things that someone can do in their home that's dealing with someone that could be having a mental health crisis or breakdown? So hopefully they've already met with professionals and have those resources in place. But if they haven't, you can call the police for help. That's what we're there for. So then we would get there and get the situation de-escalated on the front end. But those same clinicians that I'm talking about, they will come back and meet with the family. If the family doesn't have that plan in place at that time or is struggling to figure out how to, how to deal with the issues that are arising because of the mental health um, problems that they're having in their household, same thing. We will get them those resources. We'll give them tips on how to best deal with that and then get them in touch with the professionals that can help them get that family member um, on the right path. Got it. All these, are these social workers like always on call? Are they at the station getting ready to deploy if something should happen? Or are they at home and they have to get ready and get out there? How does that work? All of the above except for at home. <laughs> so every day we have, we have them working on day shift and afternoon shift. So basically from 8 a.m. till 10 at night, they're there. Always available on call to help. But I do want to give a plug to something that we had as a pilot and is in full implementation right now, it's our mobile CIT car. Mm. And what's very cool is the willingness of these clinicians. They get in a squad car, ideally it's with a CIT certified patrol officer, and they answer calls in progress in the field with our police officers. And these can be very hostile calls to start with, but they're there, they put a bulletproof vest on, just like the police officer does, and they're willing to walk into that crisis situation, and it's proven to be a huge benefit to us because, again, police officers don't have a college degree, most don't, in mm -hmm. mental health, right? But our clinicians do. So we have CIT certified officers who have some strategies and techniques and that great training, but then you have the full-time professional there who is trained and has advanced training on how to connect with that person, maybe even better de-escalate the situation. It's been an excellent resource for the department and our community members. Yeah, because the officers can see and observe and model that behavior and then going forward if they would have to. Yeah, 100%. It's almost like getting, they have such great training as it is. Right, and police but nothing is like it in person, in practice. Exactly, seeing that professional do it. So it's like putting more tools in your toolbox that that day that maybe the clinician's not with you or not available on that call you're on, mm -hmm. you can remember some of those things that she did and apply those in your day-to-day. -day. Chief, thank you so much for being here today. This was really educational. It's amazing what the department's doing, and I definitely learned a lot. Thanks a lot for having me, Joe. Really appreciate it. After the break, we're learning about heart attack snow and how we can best protect ourselves as we head into these cold winter months. Stay with us. It's only Q4, Susan. We were there when your fourth cold brew felt like a heart attack. <laughs> oh no. Cold brew has a lot of caffeine in it. We were there for that. 
affair. And we're here for everything else. Here it's personal because we get to know you. Stay in the know at home or on the go with NCTV 17 News Update. This quick recap of everything happening in and around town will be delivered straight to your email inbox for free. Sign up today. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Pinati, an internal medicine physician with Edward Elmhurst Medical Group to 630 Naperville. She's here with some tips to help us all stay safe and avoid injury this winter. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. So what are the most common injuries that you see during the winter? I would say the most common injuries or presentations we'll see this winter are slips and falls on the ice and the snow, um, frostbite on the hands, feet, face, and then something called heart attack snow or chest pain from shoveling heavy, heavy snow out there. So let's dive into a few of those. What sure. is frostbite? I would say in a short phrase, sh um, frostbite is cold mediated cell death. So it's literally injury death of tissue because of cold temperatures. And then how do you know the difference between your hands are really cold and frigid to mm -hmm. being something more dangerous like frostbite. Sure, so something, especially if you were outside wearing gloves, I mean, my hands get cold too. You come in, they warm up. That's, you know, just normal cold chills. If you feel though, like you can't feel your hands, they become numb, or you notice color changes, they might turn pale white or a red color, and it doesn't seem to go away, that's when you should start worrying about frostbite. Got it. So what about heart attack snow? That's the first time I heard that. What, what is that? Yeah, so heart attack snow is kind of just that. It is shoveling snow that can actually lead to heart attacks, uh, which is scary and, and kind of crazy. But So it's this wet, heavy snow that people are, are shoveling, and it takes a lot of exertion. Shoveling is, is great exercise. So when you are out there shoveling, your heart rate increases and your blood pressure increases. Those are all normal physiologic responses. But when you are outside, breathing in the cold air, in the cold temperature, your body also constricts the blood vessels, even the ones that supply the heart. So when you are doing this shoveling or exerting yourself quite a bit, your body needs more oxygen. So there's an increased demand for oxygen, but with the constriction, there's a decreased supply, and that mismatch can actually lead to heart attacks, can lead to cardiac adverse cardiac outcomes. And I would say especially in people with underlying cardiac risk factors, people who've had heart attacks before, people who've had strokes, people with uncontrolled hypertension, diabetes, people who smoke, people who are obese, those are all risk factors for an event associated with the snow. Ooh, that makes sense because I would think snow is equivalent to any exercise because it raises your heart rate. But the fact that it's cold outside, so my question on that is, what about outdoor running or really anything outside? If you're getting your heart rate elevated and mm -hmm. it's cold, it just poses more of a risk factor, it seems. I would say yes, and those cold temperatures are definitely more of a risk. Um, you know, before running, and I would suggest before shoveling, treat it like you're training, like you're running. Warm up before, get your muscles warm, get the blood flowing there to kind of prevent something like that from, from happening. Got it. Also no. taking short breaks. You know, don't have to be a hero out there. Shovel for 15 minutes, stop, go back you know, stop, make sure you're dressed appropriately to keep yourself warm out there, and use a smaller shovel. And avoid slipping and falling. So let's dive into that, because I know that's a huge, uh, huge thing for, for the winter. Many yes. people will slip and fall on ice around here yes. and otherwise be normally healthy. So how can you avoid yeah. some of that? I would say the number one piece of advice is to go slow. Take it slow, you'll get there if you're a minute late. Be safe getting there. Wear good sh uh, foot, proper footwear, nice pair of boots or shoes with good traction, um, smaller steps, a wider gait for better balance. And when getting out of the car, uh, make sure to take a look down before you get out to see if it's icy or you know snowy to maybe go slower, um, kind of avoid a slip right out of your vehicle. What are some other things that you recommend as far as just getting exercise over the winter? Is it 
safer to exercise inside or is it still okay to go outside? It just seems like there's a lot more risk factors. You have the cold and you have the, the uh, more of a probability to slip and fall. Yes, I, I agree. So I would say, you know, within reason, it is safe to get out there. For the few things we had discussed, there are definitely some risks out there. Um, make sure there's no, you know, ice or snow. Watch your path. Wear good shoes if you're going to walk, if you're going to run. Um, otherwise, bring that indoors and stay dressed. Nice, loose, but warm clothing, nice, warm socks, maybe some moisture wicking socks to avoid getting frostbite or getting those cold temperatures closer to your body, covering the face as best as you can, and sometimes breathing in warm air might help a little bit. Got it. When, when it comes to, to covering, I know even in the winter and cold months, like I'll wear shorts, but I'll make sure I have gloves on and, and a, a hat, and obviously I have shoes on and socks. Is that the most important thing, for your extremities, to make sure those are properly covered? Yes, yeah. And I would say, again, as long as you're, you don't feel again, numbness or anything in your, in your legs, there's not snow or ice on, on you. I know, running, you know more than me about running. You're staying warm. Sometimes shorts, shorts could work. But yes, just make sure you are covered. You're not feeling cold chills or any, any symptoms. Got it. Well, thanks so much for coming here, doctor, and highlighting these precautions that we can take for the winter. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. After the break, we're off to Anderson's Bookshop in downtown Naperville to hear Becky Anderson's top new books for the new year. If your New Year's resolution was to read more, this one's for you. Stay tuned. We were there when your kid discovered poison ivy. Now remember, leaves of three. Let it be. We were there for that, and we're here for everything else. Here, it's personal, because we get to know you. Welcome back to 630 Naperville. Up next, we're off to downtown to see what's on Becky Anderson's list of top books for the new year. Hi, I'm Becky Anderson. I'm the owner of Anderson's Bookshops, and it's that time of year, the best reads to start off your new year, 2023. One of my favorites that came out just a couple of months ago is Marple. This is Agatha Christie's Miss Marple, one of the greatest detectives in all literature. And this is written short stories about Miss Marple, new mysteries written by famous authors who are already mystery writers or they're thriller writers. And you will recognize many of them that are in this book, including Lucy Foley. Another one is Remarkably Bright Creatures, and this is Shelby Van Pelt. She lives over in Wheaton, so she's one of our local authors. This one is absolutely beautiful, fantastic. It's a family story, but it's also about family secrets. And one of the main characters is a octopus named Marcellus. So he gets to have, talk about his point of view, and being in a tank and an aquarium. Just a fantastic book, and it all works together. You will absolutely love this. This is a book for anybody. And then Signal Fires. This book is so beautifully written, I stopped to read over um, different sentences, but this is by uh, Danny Shapiro. Just a beautiful book about something that happens in the life of a couple teenagers of a family and how that one event changes the trajectory of their whole family and of their friends. But it's just a beautiful book about how we have to tell the truth. We can't keep secrets and how we can bring ourselves together. Just a gorgeous book about a family and what they've been through. And then Emma Straub. She is an independent bookseller, so we love everything that she writes. She has a wonderful picture book coming out soon. And this is called This Time Tomorrow. And This Time Tomorrow is about a woman who's turning 40 um, the next day, and her life is just okay. Things are working out all right. She doesn't really have a love interest right now. She doesn't, you know, her job is kind of there, but not there. And her father is, is very ill. He's in the hospital. And she wakes up the next day on her 40th birthday, and she's been taken back in time to her 16th birthday and what happens when you have the mind of your 40-year-old, but you're back and you're 16 year old and you see your father in such a different way. Um, and it's just a beautiful story, but um, what would you do if you had that chance? And then some nonfiction. This is I'm Glad My Mom Died. And this is by Jeanette McCurdy. If you know her, she was on iCarly and many other um, shows when she was a child. Her mother was pretty much a pushy stage mom, but um, eventually as Jeanette got older, she went through a lot of stress with her career, had sort of a, a breakdown mentally, and at the same time, her mother died of cancer. So the book is hilarious. She's, she's just a really funny person, but it's also very tender and very touching about this whole experience. 
And then John Meacham, a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer. Um, he writes the best biographies of our American heroes. And this one is about Abraham Lincoln and There Was Light. And this one is so great for now because we're such a divided nation and so was the nation when Abraham Lincoln became president. But it just shows that he wasn't a perfect person. He had a lot to say and he was just like us, but he did so much to bring our nation together. So perfect book for anyone who loves history and loves especially Lincoln history. And then Smitten Kitchen Keepers. This is Deb Perlman. She, this is one of our favorite cookbooks. She's had two previous cookbooks that have sold really well. She is a home educated chef. She has a huge blog that's won many awards. Many people follow her. But these recipes are so great because it's with ingredients you have at home. You don't have to go out and buy special things. And these recipes, along with her two other cookbooks, when you look through them, you basically are drooling all over the page. You don't have to spill anything while you're cooking, just be drooling at the same time. They're just wonderful. And um, she really does write her recipes so simple and it's, they're easy to follow. Fantastic cookbooks for anyone. And then this one is absolutely gorgeous. This is Peter Vogt. He is a photographer and has been photogra taking photographs at the Morton Arboretum in Lyle for over 20 years. And what he's done is taken some of the best photography and shown pictures of all seasons. And all of us just love the Arboretum. We're so lucky to have this place so near us. But so just gorgeous pictures through all the seasons of the Morton Arboretum. So there it is, some great picks to get your 2023 off to a wonderful start. There's nothing better than escaping into a book, no matter if it's fiction or nonfiction. But we always say, a book is a gift you can open again and again. Thank you for joining me on 630 Naperville. My guest today is a Naperville resident who recently retired from TV after four decades in news. We are here to learn a little bit more about the man behind the desk and what is next for Alan Krzyzewski. Alan, welcome to the program. Well, Liz, thanks so much. Thanks for having me here. I saw your last cat newscast and you did a, a really just a wonderful job of, you know, thanking the viewers and your, and your team and, and having everybody there. It was really well done. Oh, thanks, Liz. Thank you very much. I, I really, it's... I didn't want to take a lot of time to do it, and yet I felt I, there were some things that I really felt like I needed to say after 40 years that mm -hmm. were important to say. I'll be honest with you, uh, prior to doing it, uh, I was pretty nervous about it. A and not only nervous about doing it, but also concerned that I would get very emotional while I was doing it. I loved what I was doing. I loved the people I was working with. And, and after 40 years, you have a relationship with people in mm -hmm. the city of Chicago and the Chicago area. Chicagoans in general, I think, have really embraced their, their news people for decades. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if that continues on in the future, but, but they really have. It, it may take you a long time to become a member of the family, as mm -hmm. you put it, but it really does feel like that. And I feel that same type of relationship with the people that we're watching all those years, too. So kind of switching gears a little bit. So back to, you know, with this little segment, Naperville Notable, which you are definitely one of them. We like to, I kind of like to ask questions that are just a little different to dive a little deeper. Oh, sure. Yeah. So we asked you to pick three photos and tell us a little bit about, you know, about them and, and, and what they meant to you in your sure. life. Well, I had an interesting upbringing. My father was murdered when I was just four months old. I was a baby, so I didn't really know my, my father at all because of that. It was a robbery in Philadelphia. He was a crime victim. My mother then, as a, as a single mom then, with four kids, and I was the youngest, uh, she was in a wheelchair after I was born. She was devastated, sure. as you can imagine, and, and she faced some very difficult decisions. She obviously needed to get a job herself and work outside the home in order to financially support herself and also the children. When I reached the age of four, though, she made a very difficult decision, uh, but it was the right decision to make. And that is, she made the decision to to... I say send me, to place me and have me admitted to the Milton Hershey School in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I grew up there. I was, I, I was, I was put there at the age of four and then went there from kindergarten through 12th grade. I graduated from high school there. Hershey, yes, the, the man and his wife. Right. Uh, he was the, in, the industrialist and an incredible philanthropist. He gave his entire fortune to a trust that then, would, that then would operate the school that I attended. It was originally founded as an orphanage back in 1909. It still exists today as, as a vibrant institution. But I was a beneficiary of that. I was the beneficiary of an individual who decided, what am I gonna do with my money? All this money I have, 
I'm going to do something good with it. Well, it was a very um, brave and courageous and loving decision by your mom. It really was. Yeah. I, I mean, she, I mean, and, and don't misunderstand me. I had a relationship with my mother oh, my absolutely. entire life while she was alive. So uh, she was able to visit me uh, mm -hmm. one weekend a month. Uh, we had visitation privileges, as they called it. And I'm sure it's changed today. I'm talking about when I attended there. When my mom came to visit me that first time, and I referred to my house mother as mom, you can imagine how that crushed her heart. Oh, I bet. It's tough. But you have you've made, her, made her proud. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. We, and I, we had a wonderful relationship. She, we yeah. really did. She passed away from Alzheimer's a, mm -hmm. a long time ago. She had a quest for knowledge and a quest for culture and travel that she really instilled in all our kids, and, and she was incredibly loving. We had, a, we had a great relationship. Alan, through all that growing up in, in, at the Hershey School, was what did you want to be? Was journalism part of it? Oh, no, not even at all. Not, not beginning, certainly. Um, I, I don't know why. I've always had a fascination with aviation. So I really wanted to be an, a pilot. I, I wanted to be uh, an airline pilot, actually. I think your love for space and aviation is curiosity. What's out there? Yeah. And, that, and you have to be curious as a journalist. That's oh, like the number it's one essential. mantra is to be curious. I, so. I, 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 and I'm sure you do too. When, mm -hmm. when you speak with young people who are interested in the field, I say never lose that curiosity. But I think it all ties into a little bit with um, that wanderlust and travel, because that's another thing that you really you really love. And you mentioned with your mom that she kind of maybe have sparked that when you were 12. Yeah, she did. She definitely did. Somebody long ago uh, capped this phrase that says, travel is the only thing you can buy that makes you richer. And, and, like and there, there's a truism to that, mm -hmm. I think, because I believe as you, as you travel and you see different cultures and you hear different languages and you see families in other countries and places, you realize that, yes, there's wonderful differences between us and, and wonderful cultural differences and, and you name it, between cuisine, between language, between what you wear, between what you do for a living. All of those things may vary uh, in, in all those examples. But at our core, we are very much the same. Mm -hmm. We are human beings. We'd like to enjoy each day. We'd like to be able to say our lives are good. Mm -hmm. We'd like to be able to have food on the table, a roof over our heads. We'd like if we have children, maybe for their lives to be better than the lives we've had. That's universal, it seems to me. And I think if we had more of an understanding of that, maybe we'd be able to get along a whole lot better, too. Alan, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to stop by and share a little bit with um, our viewers and just to get to know you a little bit more. You know, we all saw you on Channel 7 and appreciated that. And now we get to see you around town. So. Well, you will. And thank you, Liz. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you. And thank you for joining us on Naperville Notable. As we all make resolutions this month, I would encourage you to think about how you can be specific and realistic. When you write down your resolutions, be as specific as possible. It will help make it easier to track and chart your progress. Also, even though we all want to shoot for the stars, if you keep your resolutions realistic, you'll be more likely to achieve your goals and move on to bigger and better targets. That's going to do it for us on this edition of 630 Naperville. Remember, if you think you can do more, you can. I'm Joe Chura, and I'll see you next time.